Hello, everybody. Welcome to this edition of the podcast Rural Crime from the Center for Rural Criminology. Uh, this week, we've got a special treat. We've got Professor Emeritus uh, Joe Donemeyer from Ohio State University. Um, for those of you who follow rural criminology or just criminology in general, um, Professor Donemeyer is a household name, a pioneer uh, of rural criminology, uh, and very, very well published and established in this field. So who better to talk to about the future of rural criminology? Uh, we hope you enjoy this episode. Well, welcome everybody back to uh, Issues and Rural Crime and Society, a, a, a podcast and vodcast series produced by the University of New England Centre for Rural Criminology. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify and Apple. And we're joined here today by Emeritus Professor Joseph F. Donemeyer from the Ohio State University. Perhaps um, we could also refer to him as the, the big granddaddy of rural criminology, given his uh, uh, wealth of, uh, of knowledge and years of, um, of, uh, of work in this particular space. Uh, Joe's the, uh, not only the Emeritus Professor at the University uh, there in, uh, in Ohio, but also serves as the inaugural uh, president of the International Society for the Study of Rural Crime, the inaugural president of the American Society of Criminology's Division of Rural Criminology, and I think wears a lot of other hats too. So thanks very much for joining us here today, Jane. Well, thank you for all of those compliments. That's just wonderful. So, so I think um, what we might do today, Joe, is um, we'll have a chat around rural criminology perhaps in its most basic form and perhaps leading to some of the, the pointier issues towards the end, but framing this around the past, the present and the future. And I wonder whether we could just start off at the very beginning and where you commenced when um, uh, in, in the field of rural criminology studies. Well, let me start out by saying that I grew up in the Cincinnati area, which is about the size of Brisbane. And so I have no rural background whatsoever. And I didn't major in criminology, but when I was a graduate student at the University of Kentucky, there was more and more interest in the issues in the eastern side of the state, Appalachia, and the problems there, the way it had been exploited in the past, and some issues having to do with, um, even then, drug use in uh, rural areas. And so I ended up becoming interested first in rural sociology, and then my first job was at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. It's the agricultural university for Indi the state of Indiana. And it was in the Department of Agricultural Economics where they were interested in a sociologist who might do some rural work on crime. And so I thought about it as people asked me if that would be the direction I'd take my career, and I decided to do it. But what happened is about a year after I started at Purdue, uh, a fellow named um, uh, Howard Phillips was funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to start a national rural crime prevention center, and it opened up an extra faculty position. Uh, perhaps that may sound familiar in terms of the growth of the Center for Rural Criminology. And so I moved over to Ohio State, and that's where my real rural crime work actually began. And it drifted in the 1990s, I mean, 1980s and into the mid 1990s as a very isolated activity for me to the, for the most part, because there weren't a lot of other scholars out there. And if you went to a criminology meeting, there was very little reference to rural. If you went to a rural sociology meeting, there was very little reference to criminology. So it ended up as one of those situations where no matter where I was, I seemed to have been on the margins of what the mainstream and those societies do. But somehow in the beginning of the 1990s, it began to come and get together a little bit, partly by research funding through the Safe Drug-Free School Act here in the United States, but also with a book that uh, Ralph Weishite, another eminent scholar at the Northern Illinois University wrote, which was actually a literature review. He had picked up a lot of the, the scattered literature and wrote a very insightful and very impactful book on 
uh, rural crime. And I really credit that book a lot for beginning to coalesce uh, scholars in the area. And so since then, it's been, uh, I've been, a, as far as I'm concerned, a, a, a face in the crowd that is watching it happen and doing my own research on uh, agricultural crime at first and then uh, rural substance use and then getting interested in uh, working with other colleagues such as Walter de Kesseretti on um, work having to do with um, uh, violence against women and finally uh, work on um, communities in crime, which is why currently I'm trying to read up on that topic so that I can rewrite um, a theory, a place in crime based upon rural experiences. Let me mention one more thing. Along the way, a rural sociologist who had moved to the University of New England, Pat Jobes, invited me over uh, the year of my sabbatical, and I began to work with Pat and another eminent scholar named Elaine Barclay on rural crime issues. That was back in 1999, I believe. It seems like it was yesterday that I was in Armadale. And uh, that was a great collaboration. We got a lot of things out. And by then, opportunities were beginning to open up for various uh, edited books and monographs. And we have what we have today with two rural crime book series, the revision of the Rural Journal, ISSRC, the Division of Rural Criminology, and of course, the Working Group on Rural Crime in the European Society of Criminology. So just backtracking, Joe, back to the late 70s, early 1980s, um, I'm just keen to explore what the law of the land was. Now, I, I happened to um, um, be scrolling through eBay uh, not that long ago and managed to get myself a copy of the 1982 book that you referred to, Rural Crime, with yourself and Timothy Carter, uh, Howard Phillips and, and uh, Todd Wershmitt and um, managed to uh, find it uh, from a book sales place in the UK and it had come from some university in rural Texas. But uh, would you say, was, was this one of the sort of the first distinctly rural criminology texts or was there, what, what was the sort of the history leading up to that point? Very scattered? Was there, um, was there a coalescing around this as a, as a particular idea? Was there a, a genesis, I wonder? That book was one of the uh, outcomes of the work that Howard Phillip Phillips did to start the National Rural Crime Prevention Center. And some of the funding that resulted in students at The Ohio State University doing some very, very early research, which um, is in hard copy only. And we'll need one day for the archives to scan it over and make it uh, available electronically. But that book came about as a result of all of those activities and the fact that I came over and, and helped uh, with the copy editing on the book. It can claim to be the first book focused on rural crime. However, there is, was a book published in the 19, late 1920s by a professor at Columbia University in New York City called Rural Crime Control. And it was mostly about rural policing. And the amazing thing about that book is that this same author um, was one of the people who originated the FBI Uniform Crime Report. His name was Bruce, Bruce Smith. And then later on, a um, founder of rural sociology in the United States, Charles Galpin, and a eminent theorist in sociology named Pitrim Sorokin actually had a whole chapter on rural crime in a book they called the Systematic Source Book of Rural Sociology. And that sort of represents where things were up to 1980. There was a smattering or a scattering of, of rural crime work and criminology that really never recognized what was going on in rural sociology. And then the same can be said of rural sociology. There was a scattering of work, but there wasn't much cross fertilization. So it remained a very undeveloped field. Our book came out and it did have an impact. It did help, 
but frankly, because the field was so, so undeveloped, its impact was a lot lower than it should have been. It and uh, things continued to stumble along until the mid 90s. Wow, that book is now 40 years old. <laughs> it always Amazing. strikes me as passing strange that, um, that notwithstanding the fact that even now in 2021, 45, 46% of the world's population, population live in rural spaces. And there's probably only in recent, you know, perhaps in the last decade or two, that has dipped below 50%. It's just passing strange that um, we've gone for several centuries of all this high intellectual focus, but uh, very much urbanised and not a great deal of um, either interest or attention given to what happens beyond the cities. Yes, yeah. I agree with that thoroughly. In fact, when you look back at some of the literature that you can find, especially in, in uh, related to the United Kingdom and, and the United States, uh, you wonder why uh, during criminology's early years in the late 1800s, there wasn't a much more sizable focus on rural. Not only uh, was uh, England at that time the only majority urban country in the world, the United States didn't become majority urban until 1917, but you look back and there was work by people on um, moonlighting and, and that, in essence that's smuggling and, and uh, Great Britain on um, vagrancy laws, which also had a very much of a rural origin to them. Uh, the Chicago School of Sociology was very much uh, influenced by a book called The Polish Peasant, which is about urban, uh, rural to urban migration. And they were equally concerned with rural conditions and urban conditions. If you look at the original Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft dichotomy, you'll find that uh, the author, Ferdinand Turney's, uh, was actually saying that in a certain kind of solidarity, Gemeinschaft, you tend to have more violent crime. And in a more rational mentality, Gesellschaft, you have more property crime. Yet, despite all of that, uh, criminology really did become very urban focused and therefore very urban bias since when it developed their societies were majority rural. And now that they're majority urban and minority rural, we're actually getting the development, ironically, of rural criminology. Well, you, you raise a good issue there and, uh, and something that Kyle and I have been speaking about in times um, not long past, and that's that uh, notion around dichotomies and some of the work that you've been doing in recent times about saying perhaps we need to reimagine um, how we reflect upon rural criminology and not get stuck in, in some of those, um, those uh, the dichotomous paradigms. I'm, I'm a real fan, and it goes back to my uh, sociology major at my little Thomas More College, which, um, if you're wondering where it is, it's near the greater Cincinnati airport, where uh, I did a lot, I, I, Majored in, I minored in philosophy and majored in sociological theory. And it was there that I became enamored with the work of Robert Merton, uh, decidedly a functionalist, and I, I tend to be more of a critical criminologist, but his idea that middle range theory is the connection between grand ideas and actual empirical work in the trenches, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, is how you advance a discipline. And so um, I constantly use that and try to remind people, uh, whether they have a sociology background or not, that uh, that is a very valuable way of looking at things. And so I've written a couple times on what middle range theories do we have in rural criminology already and where do we need to develop more? And uh, in a sense, what should they look like? And uh, that is why I would hire, a, uh, I, I think if I won the lottery, I would hire a hundred scholars just to develop middle range theories that other people can use as a research question and test in some way, whether those hypotheses, hypotheses would, would work or not. And so that's how we're going to develop in the future. And, um, be more theoretically intelligent and attuned 
and critical of what is happening in mainstream criminology. Uh, Kyle, uh, we were talking um, just recently around uh, some of the some of the issues around um, with a colleague, Matt Bowden, um, mm. around some of the issues around liquid modernity. And and just before we started today, the same um, the same uh, phrase uh, popped up when I was chatting to you, Joe. Um, so, Kyle, um, you know, liquid modernity. How, how do you how do you think that it um, that it applies to uh, the rural? You're going to throw that tough one at me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this early in the morning. Um, I think Matt, uh, Joe, we had a really interesting conversation yesterday. And one thing that he talked about, we talk about other rurals all the time and how the rural is you know, very difficult to define and it's very different in different places. But the way Matt contextualized it in the Irish context was fascinating because so much of it was pent up in history and Irish history, specifically uh, conflicts with, with, with uh, Britain and things like that. And, and um, uh, the kind of role of the countryside and particularly the role of land ownership and land rights in Ireland was something that was very uh, fascinating, important. He also talked about this notion of kind of skipping industrialization and moving to a bit of a tech-based economy rather quickly and how this clash of, I guess, futurism um, and uh, kind of the historical agrarian past are really in competition with one another now. So I think, I think that framing of, of modernity and its, its shaping on, on Ireland. So, you know, one concrete example he gave was simply just the road system and the, the contact between smaller vi villages and larger places in Ireland and how that has changed conceptions of the rural. Do you see any of that, of course, in the United States um, um, more broadly, the, the history of the rural? Obviously, each state, given the sheer magnitude and size of the United States, would have its own kind of localized or regional political cultures which might shape this. Oh, absolutely. First of all, you know, we, we have a, a transportation system in the U.S. and an and a electronic infrastructural system for the exchange of information, which uh, penetrates every nook and cranny of the country at this point. And, you know, a huge mobility. Uh, we have a great many rural counties that um, are, is populated by uh, seasonal population, either workers or uh, people with seasonal homes that consume that rural county as tourists, then we do a permanent population. So everything is in flow and in flux. And that is what the, um, the uh, future of rural society in the United States is going to be to an even greater extent than it is now. And it is now to a greater extent than it was in the past. But where I would add to what Matt Bowden said about liquid modernity is that all of those represent transitions in types of social structure at the local level in communities, whether they're large or small, but in this case, we're focusing on um, rural communities. And so I would be very careful not to look at liquid modernity as a concept, which is a very good concept and say, that's disorganization. Because that disorganization concept to me is a heritage of the urban bias of criminology that grew out of the Chicago School of Sociology. And so what we really need to understand is that social structure and cultural values and norms and beliefs are always flowing in some way. And it does influence then the context under which um, crime occurs. And uh, two areas that, um, well, one in particular that I'll point to is a book on community mindedness by Anki Stolvich, who is a scholar at uh, Freiburg in uh, Western Germany, Southwestern Germany near uh, Alsace-Lorraine. And uh, that book looked at the growth of the heroin culture in the Shetland Islands and how it was accepted by local people who had already had centuries of pretty heavy drinking at pubs. So we know what uh, substances do, but they, because of North Sea oil and offloading, 
lots of seasonal workers came in. They brought their new drug habits with them. But as long as they did not disrupt daily community life, it was simply another dimension of the community. It was a disorganization. It was simply a new influence and a new restructuring of that community. And Anki's book, I think, is a very, very excellent illustration for how we use concepts like liquid modernity to, in fact, talk about organization, not disorganization. So uh, here, here's a, uh, a discussion point that might mix a little bit of the present and the future. The future mm. being that um, uh, the Bristol University Press uh, series in rural crime is going to have its first book um, coming out in 2022 uh, called Transformations of Rural Crime. And, and in it will be a feature from you where you identify some of the gaps in the theories. So if we can think about the future, the book and your chapter, but thinking about the past leading into the present, what are some of the gaps in our theoretical understandings of rurality and rural crime? Oh, I may have to pull up that draft of that chapter, <laughs> but I'll go by memory if you don't mind. Uh, for me, the gaps begin with uh, theory related to rural policing and how to consolidation of policing uh, in areas around the world and the centralization of policing in city environments is affecting um, the context of uh, crime. And another gap, access to justice for rural people. I think that's an important one. I think we need to continue actually to increase our focus on indigenous communities in rural areas. There's been a lot of work done, but it has ignored the rural context, other than to say these communities um, are out there in the outback or in the boonies, and, and that's about it. But how does rural context uh, of those communities uh, influence the experiences of indigenous people with policing and with crime issues? I remember in the Handbook of Rural Criminology, the other series by Rutledge, there was a group in uh, Australia that had looked at four indigenous communities and clearly they had different levels of crime, different profiles of crime, which belies that stereotype that um, indigenous people anywhere in the world tend to be, uh, have a higher share of, uh, uh, a higher rate of crime, uh, bigger problems with crime, and of course, much higher arrest rates. And, and, and there is variability in this, and we don't understand it because we haven't studied it very well. So that's another area we need to get into. Probably the two biggest for me, however, are one, what I would call the trafficking of everything, humans, flora, fauna, food, drugs, what am I missing? Uh, artifacts and antiques and, and all of that has a significant rural dimension and a significant urban connection. And how do we understand that kind of crime uh, in terms of its impact on rural people, rural communities? And then the one that may be the biggest of all in my mind for the 21st century is access to justice. And that is an issue that, um, Alistair, as you know, your conference in uh, three years ago now, right? Three years ago, yeah, down there in um, Federation University and um, um, Churchill, that issue began to emerge in some of the discussion. And Kyle, you were there too. And it actually emerged from someone who was talking about um, the lack of credibility of witnesses who are, who are disabled in some way, simple wheelchair, and how the police ignore them. And that rang a bell with me in terms of some of the earlier work by um, uh, interviews with Elaine Barclay and I with farmers who felt ignored by the police because they weren't as well integrated into their farming communities. Like one fellow who had a lot of sheep stolen but he also had a job in a city nearby. And so therefore he wasn't really a good farmer and why should the police respond to the theft of his sheep? And he lacked access to justice in that way. 
And then if you start thinking about it in terms of indigenous communities in the United States by race and ethnicity, the rural version of what we would now call George Floyd, the poor man who was killed by the police in Minneapolis for uh, no reason at all other than that he was claustrophobic and didn't want to get in a police car. And they kneeled on him until he suffocated to death. You know, that kind of access to justice, these are, you know, these are good issues. They're practical issues, even if they sound a bit more on the critical criminology side. And so I would, I would say those are some of the gaps. But, you know, I think I listed in the draft of that chapter um, 22 gaps. And my list is, at best, one-fourth of a comprehensive list of where gaps are. If we could gather together uh, at uh, the European meetings or the American meetings or the Australia-New Zealand meetings, uh, a group of five of us, and just made a list of gaps, I bet we could arrive at 100 things that we all ought to be doing in rural criminology to advance the um, the sub-discipline, if I may say it that way, uh, into the middle of this century. Now, we could definitely make a very long list with those thousand people that you're going to be employing mm. in the Tesla. <laughs> I'm <laughs> One still the, playing Powerball. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that, um, that, uh, that strikes me, and coming from um, your observations there, is that um, that relationship between the rural and the urban. And whereas once they might have been thought as completely discrete, in fact, oftentimes that's still the case. What happens out there is is irrelevant to me. And and that lack of recognition from policy makers, decision makers, the general community, that what happens in one geographic space does have direct um, issues with people living in another. And I'm thinking as a particular example, well, not just some of the farm, farm related matters that Cole can speak to, but thinking of um, say Indian illegal um, mining, in uh, sand mining in India, Whereas you know, organised criminal networks will come in and completely scrape out um, uh, rivers and can and um, and uh, and creeks and other waterways because of this virgin middle class and the demand for concrete and glass and building and uh, and developing, but the impacts on the people upstream are manifestly um, disastrous. They are, and what you're talking about here is the connection of um, market economies to what happens in rural communities. Uh, another example of that, and it also involves companies from India, would be um, a palm oil development in uh, various African countries that are taking over and really destroying, and I don't mean disorganized, I mean destroying traditional farming. And in terms of these large, gigantic corporate land grabs, in a sense. And uh, so now, you know, palm oil uh, becomes important uh, for middle class cooking, consumption, diet, etc. cetera. And uh, so um, there was uh, a, an English poet from long ago named John Donne, who wrote a poem, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and it's don't ask to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And every change happening in an urban area affects rural people. Mm-hmm. And that connection is one that uh, I think rural criminologists can make a, a great contribution to just through their ordinary research, as long as they're aware uh, of how those connections influence the context of what is happening to rural peoples and to rural communities. I guess we're like just, that. Sorry, Carl. Just building on that quickly, Joe, do you think, you said it very well there, that everything that happens in the, in the urban in some way impacts the rural, but do you think that that goes to or contributes to that urban-rural divide? I'm thinking specifically politically here, and that notion of the rural kind of uh, uh, not being seen and heard, and at least that feeling being increasingly salient in the political context. Can you speak to a little bit about that, especially in the context of the United States? Oh, I think so. You know, as we know from our last election, we have now uh, bifurcated into red uh, counties that are uh, uh, rural and um, 
for instance, uh, my wife and I were driving around in Southern Ohio. We go to a bed and breakfast down there. People haven't taken down their Trump signs. And I'm sure they believe that the uh, election was stolen, uh, which is completely false. Meanwhile, if you're in my neighborhood of Northwest Columbus, which is populated by uh, a lot of people who work for uh, chemical abstracts, we have the largest um, a private research institute in the world. We have the Ohio State University, which is a gigantic university, and it's all blue and everyone wears a mask. And, and so you get that rural divide going where when we drive down to this B&B in Southern Ohio, we, it feels as if we are in another country uh, and certainly another culture. Uh, we even had a discussion when we uh, were there in October as to whether or not we should take our Joe Biden for president sign off the back of our car. Yeah. Because we weren't quite sure how we might be treated. Yet, so yet this county is so saturated with, and that's an Elliot Curry term, uh, eminent criminologist, so saturated with drugs that every young person who works there as a waiter or a waitress, uh, because they also serve dinner, um, or uh, on the staff that uh, clean the rooms, has a close relative who has died of overdose. And, you know, we go, oh, my God. You know, you're used to thinking of big cities and there are certain neighborhoods you wouldn't want to live in. And we say, we say that about rural areas. There are rural areas with levels of violence and levels of drug use that uh, you would never want to live there if you grew up in typical working class city neighborhoods where there may be crime, but not at that level. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that divide has just been getting bigger and bigger and bigger um, over the years and is now imbued in our uh, political system. Um, I have some high school friends that I see on Facebook once in a while who are making the claim that now that the only people who should vote are people who own property. And then they make the claim that 80% of the area of the United States voted for Trump, not Biden. And therefore, it was a landslide for Trump based on land. And uh, of course, I respond by um, telling them that there's a Declaration of Independence that says we were all created equal doesn't say anything about land. And, and so they're now mad at yeah. me. No, that's... <laughs> it goes on like that. And the, the, yeah. the no, divide gets larger. But putting aside who has come to fill the gap, a lot of the concerns and issues are real. And they're there. That notion of not being seen and heard. You just said the, the high levels of violence, drug problems, things like that, the absence of a future outlook uh, being so very important, whether it be economically speaking, changing cultures, as well as changing economies. And that pressure that is being felt by the rural is being, I think, very much capitalized on politically uh, and not for the best. What's the solution yes. to that? What's the, uh, uh, not that I want a grand solution here from you, but how do we, how do we tap into these very real uh, uh, experiential issues plaguing many rural spaces. And yeah, I, uh, I will make a suggestion to you on this. And it, it's kind of based on a theory in rural sociology, my original field. It's called dual economy theory. And it's applied to rural. And here's what it means, is that you have areas that have been industrialized as our economy has changed to a post-industrial economy, an information age. And so any... Um, economic sector that was based on intensive labor, farming, mining, timbering, um, have declined. Machines get bigger, they get more efficient, fewer jobs. Add to that uh, that the brightest uh, graduates of high school in those rural counties um, go to the big university and never come back except to visit mom and dad like at Christmas time. And so what happens is the middle of those rural counties has been pulled out. The middle, middle class is minimal. 
There are a few doctors, a few lawyers, a few dentists, etc. The kind of the landed gentry that run the counties. And there are the uh, minimal, below minimum wage workers, families that often own, uh, work two or three jobs, and the middle is gone. And, uh, and of course, uh, high violence against women, high drug use. And so for me, the solution, if I could wave a magic wand, would be um, to emphasize not university education, but vocational education. I mean, welding, et cetera, because um, I also live in a state with a large Amish population that only goes to the eighth grade, but economically they are prosperous today. And the reason is they are able to pass on to each other information about how to build furniture, make stoves, and do anything entrepreneurial other than farming. They also farm, but they have moved into many other things. And it's all as you go education based on very tight social capital and networking. And if I could wave a magic wand, I would do that for the non-Amish population in those areas. Is uh, small businesses where information is shared uh, in order to create um, a new middle class. One time I asked an, a, a fellow who's Amish that runs a business, very successful, he's very wealthy, making horse-drawn farm equipment, walk behind plows for workhorses and things. And I asked him, I said, Wayne, your business started with you and your dad and um, learning how to weld and looking at old John Deere plows and how to rebuild them. And I said, but now you're up to 16 employees. How big are you going to get? And he said, no more than 20. Well, I said, well, what are you going to do if you get up to 20? He says, I'll teach somebody else to start their own business. Mm -hmm. And I, I just looked at him and I said, well, that's not the way capitalism works in the city. You know, you want to monopolize. You, you, you buy up you acquire. And I said, wow, this is amazing. You're doing a populist form of capitalism. Mm. I don't think he understood what I meant by that populist. In fact, he was a bit suspicious of it, but that would be, uh, you know, as criminologists, we often say we need programs to stop something, but we often don't look at um, how the uh, economy undergirds uh, the context of a community and how crime is expressed. Now, most were still in the period of the, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can throw the programs. Sorry, go ahead. So I was going to say, well, we're still in the in that uh, nexus between the past and the present. I wanted just to um, just to get your uh, views on the interna internationalization of rural criminology. And I know you've said in a couple of things in the uh, that you've written in the past that this notion of the big four, you know that. Um, you know, criminology, rural criminology, it's really been centered um, hitherto around uh, the United States, Canada, the UK and Australia. And I'm wondering if you can um, uh, provide some sort of comments and observations about that and where you think it might, as we're starting to think about the future, where you think that might be going. Okay, well, let me start out with something that uh, uh, my uh, good friend and colleague at West Virginia University, Walter de Cassaretti, said to me about three months ago, he said, Joe, Joe, I just ran across a book on rural policing in Niger. And I went, well, Walt, where did that come from? Who is this guy? Right? And uh, so the, the internationalization uh, is going to come by these organizations that um, are able to link people in. If just as um, early as well, when did I do the rural handbook on rural criminology, the handbook of rural uh, criminology? It was 2016. Okay. And I remember in about 2013, as I wrote that proposal for Rutledge, um, it occurred to me that um, if it's going to be an international handbook, it has to have international scope. And where, I, where am I going to find these scholars? Because, oh, everyone I know is in Australia or Canada. United States 
and Great Britain. And so it's the big four. How do we do international uh, development for a handbook? And I felt like I would give myself a B minus. I did find some scholars in different parts of the world that are now linked in quite a bit to our various organizations. But there are vast areas that that handbook missed, especially Asia, especially Southeast Asia, especially India and the Middle East, which is half of the world's population. And we don't have a single chapter or scholar from those areas. And so um, this internationalization by discovering people who write about policing in Niger is just going to have to continue to, um, uh, and it's going to be hard work for those of us in leadership positions in various organizations to keep uh, searching them out. Uh, sort of, I, I'll say it this way, although I don't mean it as remote, but we're going to be beating the bush. We're going to be out in the bush looking for uh, these uh, disconnect, unconnected scholars that um, we would benefit from. They're doing stuff that's innovative and they would benefit from uh, our strengths as well. Yeah, it's always a risk if, um, if in any, any grouping people just talk to each other and don't expand their horizons and, and their boundaries. And I guess there's some, some issues around the higher education sector and metrics and whatnot where there is a press for uh, people yeah. to be publishing in big, highly ranked American-based journals and, and so on and so forth, and, and some voices get excluded. So we think about the, the sort of the rural and urban divide in, in tightly tight geographic conditions, but thinking more globally and broadly, there's also that, that edging out of, um, of uh, an array of voices too, just because of the, the structures within the um, uh, sector that we operate, up in, uh, operate in. Oh, I, I, I agree with that fully. It's um, going to be a, I think, a bright future for rural criminology because it did begin to develop as um, the electronic form of communication became the dominant form of communication. And obviously that is demonstrated with COVID-19 where meetings are getting canceled in my estimation, some of the established old associations, such as the American Society of Criminology, will be lucky to get half of its members to attend the next time when they open up. Uh, nor, that, that has had up to 5,000. And I wouldn't be surprised if once they are able to uh, have a, a, an on-site meeting, such as in Chicago, that it'll be lucky to be 2,000. And so the thing that I think rural criminology has going for it is that it is forming as Zoom and podcast and Skype and Twitter and all of the other ones out there are developing. And so the networks have a chance to be international and we have a chance to look at each other and never meet each other, but actually be good friends and colleagues. And Meanwhile, most of the other divisions in the American Society of Criminology are still stuck on uh, their old experiences. We don't have old experiences yet. No, I think that speaks to, it kind of comes full circle to what you're talking about in the beginning of rural criminology, how a lot of people were doing it, but it just was scattered and kind of no one really knew what they were doing. And we weren't uh, having a unifying point. And at Alistair's conference there, we talked about this when you talked about starting the ISSRC as a point to bring people together as a central kind of meeting space to, you know, not everyone identifies as a rural criminalist criminologists but a heck of a lot of people are doing rural criminology, rural criminology by extension and just look at the success we've had you talk about these conferences probably never being the same i entirely agree with you some of the best things i've been a part of have been those issrc panels that are very focused around a particular topic and the value you've gotten out of those by bringing disparate people together that technically wouldn't coalesque under that banner has been absolutely fascinating and that is about building rural criminology well oh, and also ISSRCs and the centers uh, um, round tables have been very successful i was part of i attended only attended a round table by two new scholars april terry and zibi key at fort hayes university in western kansas 
where it was an author meets critic session featuring uh, Walter de Cesaretti's new book on violence against rural women with a more international perspective. And it had Sandra Walklate, the former editor of British Journal, and uh, Callie Renison, a well-known criminologist, and Claire Renzetti, who is the editor of Violence Against Women, which I think is the most frequently published journal and still like 14 times a year and still has a 90% rejection rate. And, you know, it was a great discussion. Tomorrow, I'm going to be on one with Rob Smith from Scotland. He's down in a uh, university in Wales, and he's going to be doing one on Ill illegal enterprises. And I was able to send out a reminder of that on the, on the Rural Crime Listserv, and maybe a few other people will show up other than folks from the British Isles to uh, attend that conference uh, tomorrow and to learn from Rob's experiences, who I think is a very innovative form of methodology for some rural crime research, which is immersive case study research. And um, so I, I really think the world of the uh, work he has done in the past. And we just need to do in more and more of this. And the fact that there's a a center at Fort Hayes and one at University of New England. And, and maybe there'll be a few more coming up. The first winner of the Young Scholar Award was an agricultural economist, plus a criminologist, two awards. And uh, an agricultural economist gets a criminology award. That's great. And we need to do more and more and more of that uh, sort of thing in order to keep uh, rural criminology uh, diverse and every which way you can define uh, well, diversity. I think, other, I think the other key uh, aspect of the diversity is the embracing of practitioner perspectives. So not um, a whole heap of crusty uh, scholars working in isolation and in silos and talking to each other, but actually um, taking that, uh, that uh, but putting, putting things into practice and working with people at the at the sharp end or the cold face there for real solutions to real problems, of which there are many. I, I agree, the, the, especially law enforcement, um, but um, criminal justice in general has a real, uh, should have a real chair at the table in terms of views about crime and what is to be done. And if we're not interacting with them, how can we expect to influence policy and practice in any way? Uh, and um, that, so it's important that there is a place in journals and as well a place for dialogue with uh, people. Um, I was just trying to think of the name of the, uh, the officer I used to know who did stock theft investigations in, in New South Wales. I just forgot his name. His successor, I think, is Cameron Whiteside. Whiteside, yeah. Yeah. And, and then the person I met when I worked with Elaine Barclay and Pat Jobes. Um, Bradshaw. Bradshaw, yeah. Bradshaw. Bradshaw is, um, uh, those guys are, are, are it just, they just got down to earth wisdom to, uh, to present. Um, if you go to mostly women who run shelters for women who are the victims of violence, you will find the exact same thing in terms of down to earth, kind of uh, to use a, a, a a hackneyed phrase in the trenches wisdom mm. about uh, uh, issues, not simply sitting in one's office ruminating about things. And, yeah, we need a lot of that. When I first started out at Purdue University, um, I had a 70% cooperative extension service appointment, which means teaching out in the field, not in the classroom. And I would drive all over Indiana doing presentations. And I would drive away from those. And I wish I had had someone in the car to take notes because of all of the ideas you get from people's comments. And they were like unorganized focus groups <laughs> in a sense. I would present, but the questions were, even if parochial, were amazingly insightful uh, not all of them, but obviously enough that you drive home and you're completely distracted because you're thinking about what people said and what their experiences were in the real world. 
yes. not in the academic world. Well, I think it's uh, I think it's true, and and we've chatted uh, previously around some of the things that you when you on those couple of visits that you made those extended visits you made to um, the University of New England and driving around the New England area and up to Lightning Ridge, and even uh, when um, when I did have that uh, that workshop back in at the start of 2019, and you know a couple of hours in the car each direction and the ideas that just come forth, and I think. Um, I mean, it's a, a sharing of ideas, sharing of knowledge, but um, you know, bouncing off each other. I think that's one of the things that really is so incredibly attractive about the real criminology space. It's that the people and the ideas. Now, it also goes the other way. And I'll talk about my own experience. For about 25 years, I taught a course on leadership and community for the Ohio Association of Chiefs of Police. And these were for police executives, which in our system, because we have such a federated system, we probably got, uh, we probably have located about a thousand police agencies in our state. And so this uh, police leadership development college was open for rank of sergeant, lieutenant, assistant chief, chief, et cetera. So, um, and I was invited to talk on this and I did 75 classes in a row over a 25 year period. And when I first walked in, I was scared to death that anything I said that had to do with sociology would be irrelevant to policing. You know, in other words, I didn't have confidence in my own expertise. They loved it, uh, not because of me, but because they hadn't thought about their community from a sociological or maybe criminological point of view before. They, they you know, they talk, thought about their job as a series of tasks to be checked off a list, not in terms of networks of people and the diversity within that and the ideas of being proactive and community oriented in their policing. And I hit a ball for 25 years with uh, these individuals because I knew that not only was their knowledge uh, informing me, but it was going back the other way too. And it was organized as introductory, basically introductory criminology and introductory sociology uh, for what they need to do in their community to increase safety and security. So it, it's a two way street. Uh, just thinking towards the future, I wonder if you could, um, and as somebody who has been, not giving you away your age here, Joe, but somebody who's been involved in this uh, area for a little while. <laughs> uh, if you could offer one piece of advice for postgraduate students studying this area, so students who are doing their honours or their masters or their PhDs, and also one piece of advice that you might offer some of those early career researchers, those people who are uh, starting starting their uh, their academic careers now. Yes, there is one piece of advice. It's really two sub pieces, if I may say it that way. Um, if you're going to get involved in rural criminology research, do not treat it as a sideline. Find a topic or an overreaching research question and drill into it, have depth with it and continuity in your work. Because even as you're doing this work, you do need to pay attention to the tenure clock. And the only way to do that then is not to have diversions. If you're gonna do rural crime, treat it as a central part of your scholarship. And I'll illustrate this by a seminar I did at University of Kentucky, which is my alma mater. In fact, the department's still located on the same floor of the same building. And um, I could walk around and see where I used to uh, work and um, into the night trying to get my master's thesis done. And I had lunch with the grad students and I offhandedly mentioned that there is a database called Monitoring the Future Study out of University of Michigan that has every year 15,000 respondents at the 12th grade, 10th grade, 8th grade. It's basically adolescent survey on adolescent behavior. And they've been doing it every year since 1976. That you can download the data via email when I was using it. And that by 
a, a simple cross tabulation, you can pull out close to 5,000 rural respondents, either by the school they're located in or by where they said they mostly grew up. And I had a group of graduate students who said, oh, I didn't know that existed. And I said, yeah, it does. And you got quantitative data that can get you published and you can do rural at the same time. And in fact, that was one of those experiences where I realized that we need a library of journal articles and book chapters, we need an encyclopedia, and we need an intellectual infrastructure. And that may well include, include for those quantitatively minded, where are the data sources? And, and uh, how can you use them to do rural work? That is where um, uh, we need to go on that. Now for the qualitative, it's a little bit more difficult to say there are gigantic databases out there. There's no big data, but um, I guess in a way the same thing holds that the advice is if you're going to do it, get serious about it and really focus on it. And, mm. uh, uh, I think that's great advice, Joe. I think uh, it's tempting to treat it as a bit of a sideshow. Um, because I think a lot of people do come and apply there. Like I know drug scholars, for instance, that are really focused on, you know, public health or drugs issues that then might apply a rural criminology lens for one paper or two and then move away. So that, that, that's an interesting framing of, you know, committing to rural criminology and really having a trajectory. What is your, what is your overarching goal here that your research when, when looked back upon in a, in a more collective frame, what has, what, what's been its contribution to rural criminology? So I think that's a good point to ask, what's, what's your vision for the future of rural criminology? If you could dream up, you know, what rural criminology would look like in 10 to 20 years from now, what would that be? Um, I think it would be uh, more of the same. And what I mean by that is, is that there may be room for um, another uh, rural criminology association perhaps one for Asia, um, because its criminology is developing. Um, it would be more of the same is perhaps there will be a need to either expand the current journal, International Journal of Rural Criminology, or to start a second journal, maybe with a, a complementary focus. And I think that's worked well with the two book series that are out there now, the one with Policy Press and the one with Rutledge. They, they really, uh, um, there'll, there'll be substantial overlap, but at the same time, they are distinctive in, in how they're getting authors and contributions. And uh, in fact, there's probably room for a third or a fourth rural series uh, if we find enough people who are willing to take on those tasks. And so Would I think it's find... a matter of um, that. Sorry. Um, Would you want to talk a little bit about that series, Joe? The, what, which one, the Rutledge? The Rutledge, and then maybe Alistair mentioning the Bristol one. I just think for listeners, it might be something that they would tap into. So sorry to cut off your, your polemic about the future of rural criminology. We'll get back to it. But I do want to hear about this book series and not forget about it. Well, the Rutledge series um, began after the handbook, International Handbook of Rural Criminology was published in 2016. And um, I can't reach around and grab the first book in the series, but it happens to be by Alistair, who is editor of the Policy Press series. And it is on locating crime in a rural, uh, no, that's the Federation book. I just messed up your book. There it is. Hold it up so we can see it. Okay. I don't and, uh, think this is going to show up too well, but it's... Um, yeah, um, it's on rural crime prevention. Yeah, rural crime and prevention. And it has... Yeah the subtitle of tactics and techniques and which I really liked because that book back in 1982 that I did when I first arrived at Ohio State was called Integrating Research and Prevention. In other words, it was rural crime with the subtitle Integrating Research and Prevention. And here Alistair edits, edits a book and that his title has in essence the same philosophy. The um, Second book in the series now is Walter Kessaretti's on violence against rural women from the, and I insist that when he was interested that he has to take an international perspective. It just can't be American based research, although a huge amount of it is there. 
The third one that will be coming out is going to be edited by Ralph Weisheit, um, Jessica Peterson, and um, Arthur Plitz. How do you pronounce his last That's name? Arthur Plitz. Yeah. My apologies, Arthur, if you're watching this podcast, but uh, they're doing a book on um, r research challenges in rural criminology. That book came about because of a roundtable at the American Society of Criminology, where the, the idea took hold in the discussion. And then it was a matter of, well, who should do it? And a lot of us looked at Ralph as um, a senior who would really lead it up. But we need a couple junior faculty. We need the future in that editorial leadership as well. And that's how Arthur and uh, Jessica came on board. That book will be out in about eight months, I believe. So that'll be the third one. My book on the criminology of food and agriculture will be the fourth. Um, we're looking at the possibility of a book proposal on a couple other topics. One will be on rural prisons in the United States. It's hard to write about prisons except on a country basis. Um, so that one's out. Now, Alistair, the Policy well, Press series is well, coming out we, first. Just before we get to that, there's another book that's coming up in your Routledge series, and that's um, going to be edited by Rachel Hale uh, from Federation University and myself on rural victims. That's so, right. Um, and my apologies for forgetting, but in a way, I'm rather happy that I, there's so much going on, I can't remember it all. <laughs> Which is a good thing, isn't it? Um, for the avoidance of confusion, um, Bristol University Press and Policy Press are two imprints from the same same organisation. But uh, so this is under the the Bristol University Press uh, imprint, and uh, a point of differentiation I think between the two series is that this one is for those mid length monographs, so sixty thousand to eighty thousand words, so slightly shorter. Um, um, of course. Uh, you know, anything related to rural crime is, is, is well and truly welcomed. Um, empirical studies, um, uh, theoretical discourses, mixed methods approaches as well, edited collections, uh, sole authored, jointly authored. The very first book in the series, which will um, come out in 2022, is going to be called um, Rural Transformations and effectively a, a book of essays. So, uh, again, a, a mixture between some of those older... Um, uh, established uh, academics, wise old sages, Joe, and <laughs> and uh, middle career researchers, and some of our, um, our younger and emerging early career researchers too. But really, uh, sort of longer length chapters, which are really sort of essay based. You know, where are we at now with our conceptual thinking around a number of factors around rural criminology? And then we'll have um, uh, some colleagues working on on books at the moment around dark tourism, uh, farm crime. Um, uh, violence against women and a range of other uh, other topics. Uh, crime in rural China, which is going to be a, a landmark uh, a landmark book as well when it uh, when it's published. Some of those books. I mean, this gets back to the, that conversation we had earlier around internationalisation too, didn't it? And we can think around uh, some of these things around country or geographic specific, but also importantly, some of those topics which transcend. Um, geographic or political boundaries mm -hmm. and are as relevant in in Lightning Ridge as they are in um, rural Kentucky or in um, rural uh, Cambodia. You know, some of those issues you know, uh, that just, just permeate, it doesn't matter where you happen to be or who you happen to be. Uh, so, I mean, the book series really takes into account that, that diversity of views and perspectives too. And that is one point of distinction that we... we uh, should make clear is that um, policy in Bristol are more open to books that are based on an area of the world, such as crime in rural China. Rutledge um, has less accommodation for area-based books like that. They want a topic. And so when authors or prospective authors begin to think about which way should I go, that's one point of distinction for making up their mind as to who they talk to uh, first in, in doing this. I wouldn't be surprised if um, now that um, I have um, transitioned out of 
retirement teaching at Ohio State uh, and knowing that, and I handed in my grades two days ago, so this is a new transition, that um, Policy Press will get a proposal on um, building middle range theory in rural criminology. Um, I highly recommend the author. <laughs> or the co-authors. I know I'm going to be one of them because I have such a great interest in it. But I think also in the future, the book series are going to need some um, things that are uh, at, that address theory and the development of theory in rural criminology. And so that's, I think, coming up for one or both of the series in the future. I think another really exciting uh, development or uh, emerging emerging contribution to the to the rural criminology landscape is it's also going to be published by Bristol, not as part of the series, but as a standalone contribution, and that's an encyclopedia of rural criminology, uh, going to be edited by Joe and myself, Matt Bowden from from Dublin, um, Jessica um, Peterson at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, in Nebraska. And uh, and Cassie Peterson, who's uh, uh, a uh, an early career scholar at Federation University, based at the Barrett campus in in outer suburban Melbourne, and really, so taking that, I, I was struck some time ago when I um, I was flicking through a you know, different publishers, you know, regularly uh, published and and revised editions of their uh, Encyclopedia of Criminology, and there's absent anything on real criminology. This is back in 2015. In fact, I uh, I won a 50 pound uh, uh, book voucher for suggesting real criminology is an entry for the fourth edition for the Sage Encyclopedia, and, and uh, thought, oh, geez, you know, um, sort of volunteered John myself, and uh, we can contribute this if you like, and it didn't make the cut, unfortunately. So, oh, well, this is a this is something that um, needs to be um, uh, needs to be addressed, and so the uh, the idea came to be, but rather than just really short static contributions, they're going to be a little bit chunky, a bit meatier at a thousand words each, you know, highlighting just a, a handful of the key bits of research around specific topics as they relate to the rural. So we're hoping that that might be something that uh, can end up on bookshelves and university uh, databases uh, in the next year or two. What I like about Policy Press and one of the attractions of it is that, you know, the books are yeah, for, for, for Rutledge, they might be 80,000 to 120,000 words, whereas policy is more 60,000. And there used to be a series that Sage Publication did where they were just small, simple, 30, 40, 50,000 word books, usually a methodology on uh, applied regression, uh, on and on like that. And you could go to a meeting and purchase three, four or five of these that are like $5 each. Uh, and you would have the references you needed for what you did. And um, book companies have got away from that. Um, uh, you know, Sage in particular decided that they could make more money trying to sell textbooks in a mass market. Yeah. Well, rather Pell than specialized have, books. Pelgrove have their pivot series. So those 25 to 50,000 word ones, but um, yeah, I, I think the beauty of the two series, the Routledge and the Bristol ones, is that it gives some some degree of choice depending on where colleagues want to pitch their uh, pitch their ideas um, yes. into, into the market. Um, and you can, and at that level, you can do um, hard copy like softbound books as well as the um, electronic versions, which I think book companies are enamored with, but. As someone my age, I want a book on my shelf. I don't want it as a PDF. You know, in fact, if I purchase it as a PDF, I print it out and put it in a binder. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we uh, but there are various ways of delivering information. And uh, the key here is, is to have enough out there that uh, we have to worry about how it is to be delivered, what format and, and, and how we divide this up. And uh, that, that's going to be uh, important. And I always think about um, a couple uh, scholars that have published in the Rural Journal that are at universities in some um, uh, beyond the capital city of their country in Africa. They're in a regional university of some kind. And um, I always think of what is affordable for them. 
how do we access, how do we provide access to information for them? And I think that's probably, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're well and truly into the future. And as we're drawing to a close this conversation, thinking about the massive um, uh, inroads that have been made over the last, even just the last three or four years with the, um, with a number of dedicated conferences, uh, you know, the two book series, um, uh, the International Society for the Study of Rural Crime, the different uh, rural crime specific uh, as, uh, aspects of various societies, but also the, um, the International Journal of Rural Criminology. And by the time um, people uh, are watching this, um, www.ruralcriminology.org will be well and truly live. And that's an opportunity for people to come along, uh, register as, a, uh, as an author, uh, as a reviewer, certainly, most certainly as a, as a user of the journal's website and a place where uh, we can um, provide a, a forum, if you like, for a whole array of different, um, uh, of different components. I just wonder, just in, in closing, if you can just talk, talk to us about some of those different sections of the, of the journal, which will provide those opportunities. Yeah, that, that's, thank you for asking that because the, the International Journal of Rural Criminology is basically getting an upgrade as part of the digital library at The Ohio State University. And uh, what it will be able to do then is publish not only full-length research articles and shorter research notes and reviews, which has been a rather, you know, traditional format for all journals, but there's going to be a section available for practice and policy. Um, and that might be a place where uh, people with, uh, who, can, who can write well and, and organize an article can publish, but it's basically based on what they do in the field. And we need more of that in journals so that the um, traditional academic community can benefit from that knowledge. Uh, Joe, would those uh, entries have to be theoretical or empirical, or could they be heavily descriptive of heavily of, descriptive, but organized, but organized, um, so that um, they have a theme and maybe even a research question, yeah. uh, and um, and have to obviously be written at a, uh, a a good quality so that the editors don't spend uh, their valuable weekends. A copy editing and fixing everything up. But really, there are a lot of those, those practical insights that people will have, but don't have a, a place to share. <laughs> and you know, and if you organize the insights, you 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 have something worth sharing with with other people, and and that's the important point. And also, there's going to be room for for book reviews. Um, there was a, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, a Zoom meeting with the uh, Fort Hayes University people in Kansas on Author Meets Critic of Walter de Kessereddy's book on uh, violence against rural women, an international perspective with Sandra Walklate and Kelly Renison and Claire Ranzetti, some really well-regarded scholars in criminology generally, like Sandra Walklate was editor of British Journal. And I immediately contacted uh, Zeewee Key, who organized it and moderated it, and said, if we're able to get a transcript of the conversation that occurred, would it be, um, would we be able then to um, spruce it up, get rid of the ums and the ahs and all of that, and spruce it up, and with the agreement of the critics and the author, we can publish it in the journal is like a uh, like an article but in this case uh, more like a uh, a round table discussion the next time we do um, the european society meetings or the british or the american or the australian or the asian uh, would there be an opportunity to do something similar where the discussion is um, quite valuable but isn't in a traditional um, academic format for journals. The reason I mention it is, is that I realized about 10 years ago going to very staid and boring presentations at the American Society of Criminology 
that uh, I was enjoying the author meets critic sessions more than anything else because it was a dialogue between scholars who knew their stuff. Mm -hmm. And so can we put that in the journal as well? Um, we don't need to explain 50% of the variance or um, do anything else that's too fancy. It's good thoughts, more philosophical, more conceptual. Excellent. All right, we're, we're pretty much at the end there, Cole. Yeah, I think so. Um... I've been having this burning question and I, and I didn't know when to add it in. It probably should have been at the very beginning, but it's now more back to being focused on you. And Joe, I think you're a pretty interesting guy. And I think Alistair agrees as well. Um, I'll buy you a glass of wine here in the future with that comment. That's it. Listen, I know a lot of your, your early original work and you touched on it really quickly has been in Amish communities and, and with Amish culture and Amish people. Now, can I'm just really curious and interested. I think I've always wanted to pick your brain a little bit more about this. Where's that connection with, with rural criminology, rural crime, Amish and all that? Can you just speak to that a little bit as our closing kind of tangent? Very quickly, um, I actually wear two hats as a scholar, although the one I would call a, a, a hobby, which is uh, the study of uh, Amish and especially Ohio. And I've been doing that for about 25 years. And I even have taught a course on it. In fact, I have an online course I just handed in the grades. Now here's the thing, when I went up for the rank of full professor at The Ohio State, I have to demonstrate a, um, a body of work that's cohesive. And I remember having to think about that very question. And here's what the answer is. My, one of my majors as a graduate student at University of Kentucky in sociology for the master's and the PhD was called community sociology, which was a much larger part of sociology in my days than it is today. And I realized that I'm using the concept of community to do both criminology and army studies. And you probably now could rewind this podcast and I'm using the concept of community all the time in my thinking for uh, what should be done. I'm gonna be using the concept of criminology by an excellent article about rural communities written by a non-criminologist to uh, write a book on crime in place that will, uh, I hope, be a replacement of social disorganization theory, which I have come to believe is a terrible theory. And logically uh, and ca causally in every other way, uh, especially for the way it turns sociology and, and criminology toward skylines and away from rural areas. And uh, um, so it's community that unites what I do and allows me to um, think about both simultaneously. That's it. Oh, one more thing. I'm a big reader of Stephen Hawking, you know, on the brief history of time and all of that. And I've read up on uh, quantum mechanics. And I realized that most of us, especially with electronic forms of communication, are actually literally at two places at one time, which is what the double slit experiment in quantum does. And I realized that well, one of the things we're missing is, is that simultaneously, um, a great many of us are both law-abiding and criminal, depending upon the networks in which we interact at a particular time and at a particular place. So I, I think those old theories in criminology have been far too linear in their thinking, and that we can develop a new theory of crime in place that is more quantum in its approach. How's that? Now, I hope that's I'm around a, long enough to get it done. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, I think, a good way to spark some interest in this. And I hope you are, too, because I think that, that, that you've, you've definitely hit the nail on the head there of something that's missing. And I think doing a disservice to a lot of the new scholars coming in and, and trying to think theoretically about rural criminology as opposed to just just looking at rural topics, I guess, as it were. So very interested in, in this book and uh, as a means to theorize crime, place, and space. Once we get out enough theory in rural criminology, then the young puppies can criticize it and revise it. And 
uh, move forward with her careers. And the process of scholarship continues. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall mm, I, mm, do you want to do a wrap up or do you want me to? Say yeah, that no, again. Just, okay. Sorry, Joe. Oh, I thought I was being asked a question. No, that was taken. No, no, I think, I think that's it. Unless you've got anything final to add, I think we've got a good hour of, of, of chatting there. I think we could go for another couple hours, as we all know, but um, we'll package it nice and neatly uh, uh, for people's listening pleasure. But did you have anything to end on or conclude on that, that, that we may have missed? Yeah, I will conclude nostalgically uh, or future nostalgic by saying that um, um, I still hope to attend roundtables and author meets critic sessions uh, well into my 80s before I finally give up what I do. In other words, uh, I want to see this to continue to develop and I want to experience the success of the network and of individuals. Mm. Well, I mean, one of the most active in the space, and from the sounds of this conversation, I don't hear you slowing down anytime soon. No, I won't. Mm, good. We need you. Well, thanks very much, Joe. That was a, a fascinating, enlightening, and eye-opening conversation that we've, that we've had today. Thanks so much for being involved in the Centre for Rural Criminology's podcast, podcast series. Uh, a reminder that this is available on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube, um, and all the good places. And, uh, and thanks again, Joe. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It was a great pleasure to get such great questions and trying to compose answers that meet the quality of the questions. <laughs> thanks, Joe. It's been, been, been great. <laughs>